Can you hear me well? Yes, perfect. So let me introduce you to our next agenda point and very warm welcome after the break. I hope you enjoyed the cake and the coffee and talking to all your colleagues and the nice guests we have here. So the topic for our next agenda point is going to be a roundtable discussion around interop interoperable health data from source of production up to EU cross-border e-health with the perspective of importance of international standards for health. So the goal of the session is to bring stakeholders from different backgrounds with different perspectives together Stakeholders, for example, from standard developing organizations, from IVD manufacturers, from medtech industry, and from laboratories to discuss the EU vision on health and lab data interoperability with a focus on LOINC and in the context of LOINC because we are on a LOINC conference, right? <laughs> good, you got it. That's good. So even though our speakers are coming now with different backgrounds and perspectives, I dare to say that they have one thing in common. They have a passion for interoperability and improving healthcare and lives. And um, yeah, After we, to round up the whole session, we're going to have a Q&A session where I invite you, our fantastic audience, to ask questions can also be provoking questions, right? What you're interested in. I will introduce now the presenters in the order where they will be also on stage or virtually. We're going to have it mixed, right? Some couldn't make it here, unfortunately. Some are here. And I'm starting with Ligino Costramano. He's working for DG Santé and he is the strategic advisor for European Health Data Space, the EHDS, as we have this abbreviation, I hope you're familiar with it, at the European Commission. He will kick off. Afterwards, we will have Dr. Marjorie Rellens, you already very well know, the Executive Director for Lawing and Health Standards at the Regan Streif Institute. We will also have um, Dr. Stefan Sbani, he is going to join virtually. He is the IHE Europe Deputy User Co-Chair, and he is a member of several IHE working groups. He has been working for many years with the implementation of cross-border e-health information services, being in charge of the Swiss national contact point of, for e-health until the year um, 2018. Then we have another virtual joiner, Judith Kalina from Metec Europe. She's the head of government affairs at Metec Europe, and she's supporting the organization's effort in shaping and building the European regulatory environment. With her background in politics and international relations, she's supporting the trade association in the work around the legislative files. Then we have one in-person joiner, Mr. François Lacoste from Biomérieux. He is the Executive Vice President for Research and Development at Biomérieux. And then we have another virtual joiner, Peter Veramej. He is a full professor for medicine at the University of Leuven. And he works as a clinical pathologist at the University Hospitals in Leuven in Belgium. Sorry, for those who are not in Europe, Leuven is a very well-known in, um, university in Belgium. And he is heading a special chemistry laboratory specialized in metabolic and cardiovascular disorders. And he is also the chair of the EFLM, the European Federation of Laboratory Medicine. And with that, I'm handing over to our first speaker, Licinio Custramano. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me in the room? Yes. 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 Uh, please apologize um, not being there with you in the in the Lloyd conference. Thank you very much in the, on behalf of the commission for the invite to share with you the the 
exciting developments across years and the ones we are living today. So allow me to bring to you uh, a, a bit of context regarding the European Health Data Space, the flagship initiative towards digital health data. So in 2020, the European, uh, the European Union presented a strategy for data. This idea of common data spaces where, uh, where Europe could kind of become sovereign and a lead, having a leading role on how to act based on data. And in that sense, the European health data space, so the health data space came to life. The COVID pandemic also demonstrated the importance of digital services in the health domain, the increasing, and triggered an acceleration in the uptake of digital tools. And all of that, uh, again, in this line, in this vision, in this leading role, in the European Union as a standard setter for digital health. So today's challenge is even bigger than the one we had a couple of years ago. So, and to maintain this momentum that we, we set the pace on, we need to, to build a useful and vibrant health uh, data, um, European health data space. And that brings us to a couple of challenges where LOIC can play a very particular uh, role. So starting with the big challenges here, we see that individuals like us, anyone do, doesn't need to be a patient, but we have difficult accessing and controlling our health data from our devices, from our electronic health records. We have difficulties on doing that. Healthcare professionals on the, on the left side, so they also have difficulty accessing health data from different institutions. They may have access to data residing in their institution, but if there is somewhere else, how can I do that? And policy makers also have difficulties in defining new policies, new, new ways of providing healthcare, um, because they have difficulties as well to access health data and making decisions based on data. On the other side, we have the, the manufacturers, the industry, the providers of technology that would like, that would like to expand their products based on um, clinical evidence and clinical data. They have limited access to data. And we have the researchers that would like to advance um, to bring innovation to the field on therapies, diagnostics, and they also need access to data and they find the processes very cumbersome and bureaucratic. So in that sense, uh, we have a common set of challenges and we have a common set of objectives, making data available um, in this universe of spaces where we can see health as one of the nine that are there. And some of you may already see the potential of uh, bringing together data from health and agriculture, health and um, uh, environment. So there's a lot of synergies there, not just on bringing data together, but also on solving problems. How can we have this uh, technological infrastructure, the common, um, the common building blocks for that, as well as high value data sets, which are the value data sets. And this is where it comes starting, one may play a role. Allow me to bring you just in a slide, in a nutshell, what the outline of the regulation. So the objective of the regulation is to make effective use of health data. And it's, um, let's say, organized in two main folders. The use of health data, so the primary use, making this data available anywhere a citizen needs uh, treatment, so it's uh, personal health data. And the reuse of health data for secondary purposes, for research, innovation, better policy making. So it's using the data collected in primary care for a different type of uh, purposes. The regulation is organized in this way. And um, when deep diving here into the, 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 the part of the regulation that tackles the primary use of electronic health data, I'd like to bring your attention to two things here, relevant for um, standards, consistent, and relevant for cross form. First one is that the regulation identifies some type of electronic health data as priority to be integrated into the EHTS. And I, here I would like to bring to your attention that the five or six type of data that are there include the patient summary that has entries coded with uh, potentially with line, and also includes the laboratory results that have also um, observation details that could be coded with one. And this idea of an European electronic health record exchange format means that these categories of data should be made available anywhere in Europe, anywhere, any provider, 
And the question is, will we be able to harmonize how the information is coded inside of these categories, for example, patient sum? That's the challenge. The way forward seems to be aligned with law, but there are some challenges as well there. Let's talk about that. And the next part is the, the My Health at EU uh, participation. My Health at EU is an infrastructure that enables a citizen traveling to another country and that needs to go to a hospital, for example, the doctor in that hospital can retrieve data from the home country, including the patient summary and also laboratory results. And that's in order to facilitate interpretation of data and translation of the data, having data in code format is uh, somehow a must. Um, now, having said that, it's important, I'm coming to the end of my presentation, I would like to bring to your attention the following. In 2013, there was the first release of the patient summary guidelines. This is a work performed by the eHealth Network, so the member states and the commission together define this is what a patient summary is, and these are the elements that should be there. And one of the elements is observations. That can be any type of um, laboratory analysis, images, another type of exams. But this evolved to the, the patient summary in release two, so it became more solid in the sense that it needs to be deployed. And this is what we have today on the ground. In 2019, there was the, the, it was moved, inspired by the patient summary guidelines, the Health Network, and the e-prescription guidelines, the Commission set out a recommendation for an European Electronic Health Record Exchange format that follows these e-health network guidelines. On 2021, the Health Network adopted the guidelines, the release three, the patient summary, and this was a very interesting step forward because for the first time, it's not only about the, the elements that are part of the, of the patient summary, like observation details, but you also have the preferred consistence. And there we can see Lloyd showing up in the Health Network guidelines as the preferred consistent for uh, uh, observation details. But it was, it was not the only one, it's not there alone, it has more company there. And that is particularly visible in the 2022 work of the Health Network, the Laboratory Result Guidelines, where LOIN uh, is named as one of three preferred consistents uh, for uh, observation details side by side with NPU and SNOMED CT. So my question to the group is, how do we see this interplay with, um, with the other two vocabularies and if we can shed light on that so that this can become uh, simpler for the implementation of what we saw in the regulation of the common exchange format for health data. So the expected benefits, we started with big challenges, big benefits. So our expectation is that we enable the citizens to have access to their health data in electronic format anywhere in Europe they go. So in an electronic format, in a common format. That's important and vocabularies are part of that. We also, the other ones, you can see where it goes. So health professionals have access to data anywhere where this data is and they can actually translate it so that they can understand the language and uh, translation issues are not a problem. And for secondary users, today we didn't touch much, um, a lot on that, but as much as we get data coded with similar standards, uh, common understandable standards, we will facilitate the secondary use, so the reuse of this data for research, innovation, and other policy making. What are the next steps for the regulation? So at this point, it's, uh, it's being this negotiated at Council and European Parliament. And uh, our expectation is that in the coming, let's say, one year, this negotiation comes to an end and we have a final text approved and to enter into force. I can speak more about that, what is timing, entering into force, entering uh, in place and uh, implementation um, acts if you'd like to hear more. In terms of implementation, not about the regulation, but implementation of services on the ground, we have the My Health ATU extension, meaning moving from patient summary prescription only to new use cases, including the laboratory, meaning that, laboratory results, meaning that, and a patient moving to uh, moving to another country for travel, for uh, for work or tourism, uh, the doctor there can actually see the laboratory results from his home country. How that will be presented there and how long plays a role there. 
health data to you is the sister infrastructure for uh, of my health to you. You can put it this way: if my health to you is for primary use of health data for healthcare purposes, health data is back to you is for secondary use of health data. And there will be grants that we are putting forward to support member states with implementation of these services. I will close here and pass the word to the next colleagues. Thank you very much. Let me show the slide. So I'll just go ahead and get started. It's me again, Marjorie Rollins. Um, and I'm happy to be serving on the roundtable and uh, to have the opportunity to share some of Regan Street's perspectives on achieving or uh, using international standards to achieve widespread interoperability across borders and, and globally. It's important that I state that uh, at Regan Street and uh, at our very core, we believe that to improve health uh, for people globally, health care must be delivered uh, across an interoperable network of health systems and data. It's that simple. And um, we all know that having an interoperable network means um, systems must be able to connect one to one another. We need semantic standards like Moink and SNOMED supported with tools and processes to interpret meaning. But having uh, an interoperable uh, network also means having governance and policy and um, social and legal and organizational structures in place to facilitate seamless communication. And finally, um, it's critically important to reinforce the cooperation among complementary standards efforts and provide advice to implementers on how to apply the most appropriate standards. And um, an exemplar of these um, in the U.S., particularly as it relates to the, the last two bullets, is an initiative called SHIELD. Um, the Systemic Harmonization um, and interoperability enhancement of laboratory data. And SHIELD is a US-based uh, multi-stakeholder public-private initiative of the Food and Drug Administration, also known as the FDA, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC, and organizations like the Regan Street Institute, Public Health Labs, uh, standards development organizations, and medical specialty societies and others who come together to improve the quality, utility, and portability of electronic laboratory data. And this happens through a harmonized uh, implementation of semantic data standards like LOINX, NOMAD, and UCOM that have been appropriately qualified or vetted um, by a, uh, an authoritative source. And the mantra for SHIELD um, is that codes for laboratory data should be interoperable, um, describe the same test the same way every time. Many of you are aware of that mantra. Uh, and by improving um, the semantic interoperability of laboratory data within and between institutions, diagnostic information can be used to better support clinical decisions and enable, as you know, relevant and reliable real-world evidence. Uh, drilling down a bit more, um, the SHIELD initiative was an essential model or construct to have in place in order to respond uh, to the pandemic and, oops, I'm, I went too far, uh, in order to respond to the uh, pandemic and understanding that SHIELD is a public-private collaborative Throughout the pandemic, organizations like the FDA, the CDC, 
the Association of Public Health Laboratories, Loink and SNOMED, and IVD manufacturers met weekly to cre create codes and concepts for laboratory testing, clinical care, public health reporting to support the response to the pandemic. And also mappings were developed uh, between LOINX, NOMAD, and UID codes and specific manufacturer kits for SARS-CoV-2 testing. I know SWAPNA was involved in a lot of that. Um, the mappings were published on the CDC website in what is called a LIVID file, which I'll just describe uh, briefly, shortly. Um, the important point to drive home here is that um, the activity amongst these diverse entities represents necessary and important cooperation and collaboration in the broader context of realized interoperability that could occur across borders. And, and then I want to mention another example of cooperation among complementary standards, uh, which is the IVD Industry Connectivity Consortium, also known as the IICC, and I know many of you are familiar with them. Um, the IICC is a global nonprofit organization dedicated to creating and uh, encouraging adoption of unified connectivity standards um, to reduce the cost and variability of data exchange between laboratory instruments, middleware, and laboratory information systems. And one standard that the IICC developed is a standard digital format for vendors to publish LOID terms associated with each of their, lab, uh, their test results. And the standard is called LOINC for IVD or LIVID. Um, the SARS-CoV-2 mappings that SWAPNA was involved in that we just discussed are included in a, a LIVID file and is published on the CDC website. And uh, many IVD vendors are currently providing their test catalogs in the LIVID format. And as more vendors make these LIVID mappings available, the reduced effort and expense of choosing the correct uh, long term will dramatically advance the ability of labs to implement standard terminology and ultimately also exchange data that is interoperable. So um, in closing, you know, I want to reiterate how important it is to have governance policy, social and legal and organizational structures in place. That isn't always as fun as developing the semantic standards, but you got to have it. Um, and the importance of cooperation among complementary standards in order to have the widespread interoperability that could occur across borders um, and, you know, globally as desired in the U EU. And the SHIELD and I, uh, ICC initiatives are great exemplars to achieve that goal. So thank you, and move that on to the next. Many thanks, Marjorie. Our next speaker is Dr. Stefan Spani from IHE Europe. He will join us virtually. And you know we will take your questions then at the end as a roundtable discussion, so prepare them, write them down, don't forget them. Uh, good morning, everyone. Sorry for being in, uh, physically with you, but COVID changed the plans. So I would like first to introduce briefly IOG, Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise. Uh, it's a non-for-profit organization which do not aim at creating new standards, but more capitalize on existing ones and creating interoperability profiles. That's why we strongly rely on HL7, DICOM, but also on LOINC. IG is structured into deployment committees and domains. Deployment committees support national activities, regional activities, while domains are developing the new interoperability profiles, the interoperability frameworks. And uh, probably one unique characteristic of IG is that 
every entity, development committee domain, are have members both from the user side and the vendor side. Every in every entity you have this duality where you have representative of both worlds in order to make them speak together and that the solutions provided, uh, developed by IG do correspond to users' needs and to vendors' capabilities. IG is working in different domains. It's more than 20 years uh, it was created. And one, the, the, one, the domain interest for today is the pathology and laboratory medicine which already had a certain number of available interoperative profiles, uh, mainly uh, workflow profiles, the sharing of laboratory results, and in particular, what is called XD Lab profile. And in all these profiles, the preferred encoding scheme for describing the laboratory-related information is LOINC, that is recommended. Uh, two words about how we approach uh, a problem. The key starting point is the use case. We always start from a user's problem. What is the problem to be solved? What is the problem for the user? For which use case do we need a solution? And then, as I mentioned that before, we try to capitalize on existing standards, like lawing for laboratory information. Out of that, we combine the different existing standards, we add missing parts, and create interoperability profiles. What has not to be forgotten is the testing strategy. You may have very good standards, very good interoperability profiles, but if they are not tested, if the different Implementers do not have the possibility to validate their implementing it properly. It may lead to incompatibilities between different implementations. So the testing strategy is uh, a key aspect, a key step in the implementation strategy. And we also have possibility to make certification. We have a conformity assessment program that goes far be be uh, beyond the, the simple testing strategy. Uh, with the conformity assessment by um, certified uh, laboratory, accredited laboratories. Implementing uh, interoperability laboratory sharing, first thing is to avoid proprietary solutions. Uh, laboratory results, the uh, senior also mentioned that it's one key element for the continuity of care. Uh, at least for, the, for the, the primary use of the data. If we, have, if we implement the electronic patient records, uh, we need to have also the laboratory results there, and we should not have the lab results of this lab, of this lab, of this lab, in different documents, in different things. We should have something like an Excel tab uh, with all the results, whatever the provider, the lab provider is. So there is a strong need also for that, and of course for the cross-border, for interoperability standards, for conveying, for being able to merge the different results, to group the results together, to show the evolution of, of the different values. And the users are the key trigger for mandating interoperability. It will come from the fact that the user will ask, will require interoperability, will require that from the providers, from the vendors, that we will have the interoperability implemented. And it's possible for the user to, to require interoperability. Uh, for example, the XDLAB uh, IG profile is part of the 27 IG profiles endorsed by the Commission as part of procurement processes. So you can require the implementation of such interoperability profile in a call for tender. And the laboratory data, as Vicino mentioned, is part of the new electronic health record exchange format, and the specification there is based on the IG profile XD lab. And finally, of course, the standards are not covering everything now, but they can evolve, and you can contribute to the evolution of the standard, both as vendors, providers, 
in the management of uh, systems and as users putting in front your needs. And just conclude by uh, mentioning a, a very good document produced by our colleagues from uh, IGD Netherlands on guidelines for digital exchange of laboratory data uh, or for a nationwide exchange of laboratory data. Thank you. Many thanks, Stefan. Um, we turn over to the next speaker, which is Judith Kalina from MadTech Europe. She is joining us virtually from Brussels. Judith, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good. I mean to get this fully on screen. Can you see my screen? Okay, thank you, Sabina, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you very much for um, inviting me here to this panel and to inviting MedTech Europe in my uh, role as MedTech Europe uh, representatives to the conversation. So we're talking today about interoperable health data and how we can bring it from the source of production to where it can actually add value. And um, talking about the source of production, a lot of the data that we work with um, today is produced by medical technologies. Um, we sometimes say that medical technology is at the heart of the health data ecosystem because it's the source of much of the health data that has the potential to make the digital transformation of health systems um, that we talk so much uh, nowadays a reality. And uh, to make health data more accessible and available, of course, we need broad and systemic interoperability. And uh, today I want to focus uh, on interoperability from more of a governance perspective and perhaps also react a little bit to what Vicinio already shared in his um, opening presentation on um, what um, the EU is, is doing in terms of um, the European health data space. But um, maybe start off with a little bit about us and um, who we are. So MetaCure is a European trade association for the medical technology industry and that includes uh, diagnostics, medical devices, but also digital health. Um, and we are a member organization, so we have national, European and multinational companies that are our members as well as national associations in Europe. And um, the medical technology industry in Europe is pretty big, if I may say. So we have uh, our members manufacturers more than 500,000 products, services, and uh, different solutions for the European market. And a lot of them are uh, digitally connected devices that, as I said, produce and use health data and are thus relevant for um, the interoperability discussions that we're having. And um, so, we are talking about interoperability today, and I believe that everyone attending this event today agrees with me that we need interoperability to, uh, in healthcare to be able to, to share and make the most health data. MedTech Europe has articulated this position for some time already. But the problem is that there are so many complexities to it, um, and panelists before me uh, have somewhat alluded to it already, and I've tried to depict it here in the slides. Um, there's a myriad of different factors influencing our goal of achieving interoperability. Um, and one is that there are so many different actors involved that need to align to make uh, interoperability work. We have care providers and caregivers that on one hand need to articulate their demands and needs. We have standard setters like um, Roink, um, that need to create the right standards that work for everyone with manufacturers um, that need to foster better understanding of how their devices work and of course we have public authorities that um, should implement systems that incentivize the convergence of demand for interoperability for example by using international standards and talking of public authorities, I want to focus a bit more on what's going on at uh, EU member state and uh, EU institution level. 
Uh, at member states level, interestingly, a lot of governments have been looking at new mechanisms of um, um, how to better implement interoperability in the last years already. And some of them, like the German care modernization law, the Germans among you will know it as the DFL PMG, uh, are even including interoperability mandates for devices or um, electronic health record systems that uh, manufacturers want to put on the market. Uh, so a kind of interoperability by design concept. And similar things, as we see already alluded to, uh, are happening at EU level. We have the European Health Data Space that, uh, is, that wants to create an ecosystem made up of rules, common standards, um, and practices, and set up a governance framework that also contains provisions on the interoperability of uh, EHRs. And it sets up common specifications for interoperability. And as medical technology industry, um, we really appreciate authorities at EU level to take an active role on this, uh, making supporting interoperability and the setting of standards. Because the EHDS is an opportunity, um, to say the least. Uh, but to make interoperability work well through this legislative framework, um, we as the medtech industry have a few uh, recommendations on how um, on, on how we should be going forward. So Medtech Europe believes that it is paramount that the EHDS is consistent with international consensus standards because the current legislative draft uses um, common specifications for interoperability but that might in fact be a little bit problematic because they may not be fully up to date with the state of the art and they may even contradict international internationally recognized interoperability standards. Then secondly, they should be developed, um, the, the legislative framework should be developed with stakeholders such as, such as industry, but also standard setting organizations. Um, it's really important that you know, all stakeholders have a seat at, at the table, that we work together because only with input from, the, from practice, from the ground, can we really know what we need? Thirdly, we need to avoid national and regional fragmentation across Europe. We've seen this with other uh, regulation that interpretation at national level um, can sometimes be different from member state to member state. So we need clear guidance that avoids confusion and fragmentation in member state implementation. And lastly, we need appropriate times for transition, meaning time to adapt for all organizations involved, um, especially looking at the length of development cycles of um, uh, medical technology manufacturers. But if we get it right, uh, we believe that we can really create a system that works for everyone, uh, that brings innovation for better prevention, diagnosis and treatment. Um, but it really needs to look at these couple of things, international consensus standards, and everyone at the table. Thank you. Many thanks, Judith. And now I would like to ask Francois Lacoste to join me here on stage. <laughs> Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me uh, being with you uh, at this uh, Low Inc uh, session and being part of this Low Inc community. So my purpose today is to share some information about BioMario, who we are. Uh, for some of you, uh, you are familiar, but just to describe our activities and why uh, interoperability and data matters in our field. So first, uh, starting with a company presentation, uh, we are uh, specialized in infectious disease in, on two segments. First one is uh, clinical applications, meaning providing solutions for the hospital labs, private labs. And the second one is uh, what we call industry microbiology uh, control, meaning uh, providing solutions for uh, pharmaceutical companies, food and uh, cosmetic industry. So 80% of our 3.3 billion cells is dedicated to clinical applications and 20% is dedicated to industrial uh, application. We have uh, 30,000 employees at the worldwide level and um, even if we have a large uh, uh, 
team in France. Uh, it's uh, mainly an international company and 93% of our sales are generated uh, outside uh, France. Uh, two important uh, numbers. So we, we have uh, roughly 80,000 systems, uh, instruments in the world, in the private labs, in, in uh, hospital labs. And every day of the year, we generate uh, more than uh, 500,000 test results. So meaning that uh, data matters and health data matters. Our strategic uh, uh, focus are... Uh, oh, yes, sorry. So... Our strategic focus uh, when we speak about clinical applications are antimicrobial resistance, respiratory infections, sepsis, and emergency care, that is for clinical applications, and for uh, industry applications is to protect uh, consumer health. We invest 75% of our research and development budget to antimicrobial resistance, uh, being able to uh, identify, characterize pathogen, uh, we work also on host response, and uh, um, our R&D strategy is uh, beyond antimicrobial resistance uh, to adapt to emerging uh, diseases such as COVID, for instance, but also to uh, move towards more decentralization of uh, patients. And at the end, also, IT and data, we have within research and development one team dedicated to develop solution for the customer Beyond the systems and the software embedded with the different systems, we have also a standalone uh, solution called the middleware, which are able to connect different systems within the lab, which can be uh, BioMario or also uh, other uh, solutions provided by uh, other uh, suppliers. And the goal is really to manage within the lab the flow of uh, analysis, the flow of data, and it's where interoperability uh, takes, uh, takes a lot of, lot of importance. Then, uh, if we look at our long-term strategy, uh, there are three pillars. Innovation, we invest 13% of uh, the turnover in research and development. It's a six, 1,600 uh, people within uh, research and development. We have also uh, active uh, business development, uh, partnership and acquisition, and geographic expansion. We have 42 subsidiaries. We are present in more than 165 countries. But what is really key is for each of the solutions we provide to the lab or each of the solutions we are developing in research and development, there are two attributes. One is medical value. Second is lab efficiency. By medical value, we mean, it means uh, in terms of uh, pathogen, all the solutions which can help to better detect, uh, identify, characterize uh, different pathogens. Uh, but we are also working on, on host response biomarker, uh, which uh, play an important role in uh, infectious uh, disease. And then in IT and data with the, the, the goal to provide augmented diagnostic. A concrete example, for instance, in, 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 a, in an hospital, when you have a uh, pathogen ID, you can add information related to the uh, uh, ecology in a given world, which can provide additional information and insight for the physician. Then the second dimension is around lab efficiency, meaning connectivity. We already talked about that with different systems, uh, time to result, and again, IT, IT and data, but then more uh, dedicated to uh, workflow management and, uh, and insight. And it's where low ink plays an important role with this lab efficiency uh, dimension. And why time matters? Because when you uh, consider the entire flow within uh, the, the, the lab and outside the lab, it starts from sample collection to results provided to the physician. And you have a lot of different steps which can be very cumbersome uh, sometimes. Uh, we are usually focusing on the time to result of a given instrument, but sometimes you have the sample uh, which will uh, stay for hours uh, before to be uh, incubated in a, in a given instrument. So the, it is really the entire workflow that we need to consider in order to reduce the time to result. And why time to result matters? One practical example, <clears throat> in a septic patient, each hour which is lost with uh, an appropriate antibiotic treatment is increasing the risk of death by 10%. So it's really key to make sure that uh, we have uh, efficiency and it's where low ink is playing an important role. And it's what I want to describe in, in those two additional slides. First one, yes, this uh, universal data codification is a tremendous help, I would say. In a, in a lab, 
um, the, the identification of a bacterial can be performed on, on a system and the susceptibility testing with a different system by your different suppliers. All those systems, they need to communicate and they need to communicate at the system level, not at the laboratory information system level, meaning that this common language is really a, a, a key enabler. In terms of uh, benefits, it's not only for the lab manager, it's beyond the lab. More and more, uh, we, uh, BioMario, as over IVD player, we are interacting also with the, the physician. And uh, the clinical information is also uh, to improve uh, patient management. For the patient file, it's a better patient information. For reimbursement, it's also a better healthcare expenditure management. And at the end, in terms of secondary usage, it's also... Uh, Uh, using data to uh, uh, build uh, health economic studies, for instance. So we see all the benefit. One example in, in France, uh, LOINC is uh, embedded into the asset code used for uh, outpatient in, in France since uh, 2014. So it's really a, a, a reality. The information is part of the electronic uh, medical record. So we, we can see the concrete implementation of LOINC on a day-to-day -day basis. Then... Uh, how can it become a reality? It has already been said uh, before, but uh, international standards, and without uh, exceptions and avoiding to have local specificities and so on. There are many uh, applications for which we have different uh, regulations, which are not um, based on scientific data, but which create a lot of burden for us as uh, IVD manufacturers, but also in terms of patient management. You have different reference Uh, standards which are uh, complexifying, I would say, patient management. The IVD system should be the, the source of information, uh, as I said before, not necessarily at the LIS uh, system. And then for us, it's important really to uh, uh, have a good cooperation with the standard development organization, public authorities. And it's the reason why BioMario is really part of the lowing community for many years. Uh, we are uh, supporting uh, all those efforts. And within research and development, I can tell you that all the lowing, uh, I would say, requirements are embedded in all our uh, development. That's why I wanted to share from an uh, industry uh, perspective. Thank you very much. Many thanks, François. The next presentation, our one more and last presentation, is going to be performed by Peter Vemish, who is joining us virtually from Leuven. Is that correct? Peter, are you ready? You are still muted, Peter. Yes, yeah, I am you. Yes. Okay, okay. I can see that. Hello. Great. Okay. Great to have you. Thank you. Um, so I'm uh, Peter de Mees. I'm the I'm work at the University of Leuven. I will give you some some uh, personal experiences and also let's say my user gap analysis where I think uh, structured data can be really helpful. I'm the chair of the working group of the post analytical phase, which includes laboratory result reporting, hence my involvement in the conference. Um, when we look at big data in laboratory medicine, we consider, I think it's at least two in Belgium, that laboratory medicine is currently the largest producer of what I would call structured data in electronic health patient records. Um, and big data analysis and artificial intelligence, uh, we believe will, as also the EU has stated uh, in its uh, data policy, Uh, that these data and artificial intelligence can play a crucial role in revolutionizing the diagnosis and treatment of patients and open the way for, for more uh, personalized treatment of patients. Our European Federation also identified big data and how to use them and improve outcomes as a uh, crucial strategic challenge. And we believe, in fact, that laboratory medicine will be at the heart of a network where we will have to integrate uh, 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 as other medicine professionals, data both from pre-analytical, -pre so clinical information, information from uh, multi-omics platforms, routine laboratory results, use artificial intelligence to interpret the results and that personalize the treatment, for example, by uh, optimizing doses or selecting drugs for cancer treatment. When I look at my personal experience, um, In Belgium, we have a national e-health platform, which allows both patients and medical professionals to consult 
uh, health data, uh, which, and which include laboratory test results, vaccination status, COVID-19 test results, for example, during the pandemic, and also uh, electronic patient records. The laboratory test results and are the only results which are really well structured. Uh, electronic patient records are uh, typically included uh, and reports only of, uh, for example, radiologic investigations, CT scans, as, uh, let's say, PDF format. Um, this eHealth platform currently uses a local variant of blowing the so-called RATAM list, which is a subset, plus some Belgian codes named after our previous King Albert. It also allows lack of specific codes, which is always a bit delicate if you start to uh, standardize and structure your data. And currently, but it's, it's faded out, non-coded results. Uh, so it is still possible when there is a request for the national platform to generate a PDI, PDF type report uh, as a lab. In the near future, we will uh, switch to FIRE, so HS7 based. Uh, our hospital, in fact, has its own electronic health record system for already more than 25 years, which was commercialized in 2016 in uh, Flanders by a partner. And we are now, in fact, already 38 institutions accounting for approximately half of Belgian, of Flemish hospitals and 30% of the Belgian hospitals. And uh, I think this is, this also shows you one of, one of the advantage of structured data. We have a Nexus Health app website where patients can only consult their results but also see their appointments for example and other useful informations their medication uh, prescriptions etc um, and also healthcare professionals can access this uh, platform the fact that we can do more than you can do in the national health platform is linked to the fact that we have one database so all data have to be added in a structured uh, format for laboratory test results uh, for example um, which are a combination of LOI codes and that's always a bit the, the leftover category, what we call PZL codes for typically some rare disease testing. Uh, test for which there is no really optimal uh, LOI code, uh, something which I will address later on. So the specialty testing typically is also very important for rare diseases, oncology, uh, emerging infectious diseases, toxicology, etc. When I look at the routine laboratory data, thinking creatinine, liver function testing, hemoglobin. Currently available analyzers, LIS is allowed to uh, collect the data in a structured format, store them in a structured format, send them in a structured format to a central database. Uh, and these results are also typically, let's say, somewhat interchangeable as most of these tests are traceable to reference methods and materials. So in theory, you could use a creatinine from one lab uh, today and compare it to a creatinine result of another lab uh, in six months. Efforts are, however, needed to uh, really standardize the data structure. I'm thinking uh, not necessarily the lab results, but also broader patient identification, other information um, to allow, in fact, access from outside the health institu institution uh, and, for example, outside of the own country, uh, both by healthcare professionals and the patients. Uh, something we are missing a bit as uh, EFLM, or we at least don't really know how we have to include this, is that when you look at laboratory test results and on a test by test, test by test basis, but you can have pre analytical sample issues, for example, hemolysis, uh, patient identification issues, which can be linked to one of the samples of a blood collection, but are, cannot occur in all the samples, and hemolysis can affect some of the results of the sample, but not other results. How should we store this kind of information? That's something um, which uh, which I think we need to think about. Um, I'm also thinking about the repetitive comments in our own data structure for the moment. These are not stored in the central database, but th these are generated by the by the LIS system. At the moment you generate a report, you get them the comments. Um, so that's something uh, which is not directly coupled for the moment to the individual <coughs> test result. When I look at specialty testing, such as inborn uh, errors of metabolism, for some of these tests, a significant number, in fact, there are uh, loin codes. I'm thinking, for example, neonate screening. But this is not the case for all the codes. And depending a bit on the type of test, I'm thinking, for example, antibody-based tests for some, I think, for example, antineural antibodies, uh, there is typically a lack of reference methods and reference materials, which makes uh, which has as a consequence that there is not no good standardization and that the results generated by different laboratories might uh, not be directly comparable 
as this can result in different sensitivities and specificities and different cutoffs. And how we have to deal with that, I think, is one of the important <coughs> challenges. Can you use generic codes? Who has to decide whether it's an asset specific code, when not? Can people uh, use open uh, codes as we can uh, use them today in our own system, the Belgian system? But then you have obviously the risk of an open, uh, of an open standard that you end up with the uh, same number of codes as there are laboratories in Europe, uh, which is also definitely not what we need. So this, I think, is one of the important challenges. However, um, I think the lesson from the IBDR is that we cannot forget about the specialty testing, the IBDR. Many of the work, was, much of the work was in fact focused on the large volume of CDIVD tests, which in our lab, for example, account for 98% of our results. But the majority of the tests we offer are in fact non-CDIVD, rare diseases, uh, for example, sample types which are not typically investigated, uh, uh, for example, from a drain of a patient who had surgery. Uh, these are all uh, tests, for example, for which are no CIVD alternatives, and for which, for example, although uh, the IPR is in effect since uh, May 2022, we still do not have any formal guidance on how these assays, uh, when these assays can be used and how they have to be validated. I think it is important for the European Commission to take into account the need for specialty testing, uh, when they devise the rules that, uh, that say we do not end up with, uh, with issues there, that it will be difficult, for example, for genomics, toxicology, or emerging diseases, I'm thinking then COVID-19, which also showed that we cannot only rely on CIVD tests, we need some flexibility to respond rapidly, uh, despite the fact that the obviously CIVD industry played a crucial role also in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think this is a bit important. We can, if there is no possibility at all, to use as specific codes and so an open standard that can also cause problem. Finally, if I look at the so-called total, total testing cycle or brain-to-brain -brain, uh, loop, uh, when we're talking LOIC, that's also when we're talking, in fact, typically coding in laboratory medicine, we're typically talking about, let's say, pre analytical phase. The doctor has put in prescription for laboratory tests to be performed. We have direct clinical requesting. This, the, the, the nurse uh, or the phlebotomist will draw the required samples. These are sent to the lab. We analyze them, we report them. We send results to our a data server. The clinician can request a report. LOIC, I think, is ideal for coding, uh, for coding this, this part of the total testing cycle. A major challenge, however, remains then to link these results. I'm thinking then big data research also. How can you try to then uh, identify um, for example, new, new insights which could improve uh, patient outcome is the post-analytical post phase. We have in Belgium, for example, the Belgium variant, the BE, um, for the ICD-10, the limited uh, subset of codes. So real diseases are typically coded, but obviously it doesn't cover everything. This doesn't cover, for example, all kinds of treatments that the patient is receiving. There are codes for that. I'm thinking, for example, about SNOMED CT, which has been or which is being used by some of the patients in our uh, hospital. Uh, this, I think, is also important to take that into account when we're talking uh, structuring uh, the uh, uh, health data. And also, the so called pre pre analytical phase is also very important. I'm thinking about coding symptoms, different ways there. There are low codes in our hospital. We have some experience with SNOMED CT, but we are not yet using it really in the laboratory. Our emergency physicians, for example, use uh, SNOMED-based uh, coding to code symptoms and also some of the treatments, and they generate their, uh, their, their patient, their report, in fact, of the uh, admission using, uh, at least partially using these codes. But we are currently not yet, let's say, importing these codes, for example, to use them to help us when we interpret the results. When I'm interpreting results of rare disease testing, I'm typically looking into the patient health records and uh, looking at the unstructured information the clinician has provided. I think uh, it's also it will also be very good if we can find ways to uh, to uh, structure really the, the patient the patient uh, health record information, both pre pre analytical, so the symptoms, and then also treatment and uh, outcomes. That's uh, my slide, uh, my last slide. I wish to thank you for uh, inviting me also. I think it's very interesting that uh, there is a European effort to improve uh, the structuring of uh, health data. Thank you.
Many thanks, Peter. So now we now we open the floor for questions from you, dear audience. I hope you have a lot. And we have decided to start with lunch ten past twelve to have the time for some question because it would be a pity to to let the people go without having any questions. So please use your microphone on the table that the presenters can hear you, especially the virtual ones. Please go ahead. You have to press the button okay. to, to okay. have a red light. Hi, my name is Mark de Graal. I'm from the Netherlands. I have a question regarding the European standards and the XD, uh, XD Lab um, standard, which is mentioned there. XD Lab that's based on uh, H7CDA and it's based on LOINC. Um, of course, there's a very strong move for, from HL7 CDA towards HL7 FIRE. And also SNOMED has an important role in uh, clinical data. So is um, the XELAB exchange also moving towards FIRE and incorporating SNOMED? Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I do not have specifically the answer for XD lab but that's a, a general tendency to progressively move from HL7 B2 B3 CDA towards fire. Uh, the, the the driver will be the, the user's need. If, if there is a need there, there will be a, a fire version of the, the XD lab. That's already the case for some other profiles uh, medication also, we're working on moving to, to fire, for example, for such a data. Uh, I, I'm not sure the exact status of the lab, but I can forward the question to the lab domain. Okay. But clearly, it's the, the, the move is going on towards fire. Yeah. So I, I guess I'd like to clarify, um, when we talk about um, the, the use of snowman and fire, and like and snowman together, there's a couple ways you can imagine that. One of them is that the most common is that like is the observation code and snowman is the answer code, the value code. And sometimes people think of those as being you can use either for either thing. And that's that's not right or it's not ideal because then you end up with a lot of confusion. Now, so I just wanted to clarify that as sort of how I think we should be thinking about it, and I think a lot of labs think about it too as well. Well, that was a good comment, so thank you. We have one more question here from the audience. Please go ahead. Yes, I have a question, I think, for a few speakers. Uh, first speaker mentioned... Uh, uh, sorry? To Lichinio, right? Yes. Um, the, the patient summary and the lab data that is vital for uh, um, f information exchange when a patient is coming from abroad to another country. But in um, Europe, we have not been able to harmonize on conventional users, uh, units, versions, uh, international system of uh, uh, units. So... One lab, one country may be using millimoles per liter, other countries use uh, milligram per deciliter, including the United States, but that's not, not yet in Europe. Um, how are we going to deal with that? Because the meaning of results will not be uh, fully understood in another country. And Peter Vermeers made a very good point on uh, the, the specialty testing where lab results are not always comparable uh, between mm -hmm. systems of different uh, providers. Yeah. <coughs> Excellent question. Licinio, okay. any comment from your side on this? I acknowledge, uh, the, thank you so much for the question. I acknowledge that in, in the patient summary guidelines, what we have is that the observation results should be uh, uh, represented in SNOMED CT, as uh, the previous 
uh, colleague in the room uh, mentioned Boing being the observation code and SNOMAD being the answer code. So the result being expressed in SNOMAD, but regarding the units, we have mentioned that we should use the UCUM. But indeed, I think the question was about harmonizing how units are being used, and I think you are fully right. That's <coughs> something we need to work on. We don't have that. We have the vocabulary to express the units, but harmonize how we, uh, we, we do the units, how that we, we don't have any guideline on that. That was your point, right? Yeah, that was certainly my point, because very large countries like Germany is still using conventional units, France and the Netherlands, and I think part of Belgium is using uh, Système International. And I think sure. Spain so, does also. Thank you for that. We have another two, three comments. First, Clement, go yeah. first, uh, please. So, we, you know, in terms of units of measure, I know we ought to really think hard about using UCOM because you can translate them fairly easy amongst uh, commensurate units. So if you don't like this one, you can use the other one and get the value to adjust it accordingly. Uh, and it's, um, it's very easy to use. Um, so I, I just think you ought to think hard about using that routinely. And all the standards, DICOM, HL7, both FIRE, V2, etc., all specify UCOM as a unit of measure code standard. Yeah, I think, I think Joseph Arts. Um, I think more the, the technically it's not a problem. We have these Westfield web services that can translate, uh, transform. But I think the problem is the interpretation of the results. When you see as a doctor, you see the medical doctor, you see it in a unit that are not what you used, then of course the interpretation is difficult. Thanks for the comment. There was another question over there. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm reacting to the uh, last part of your question, which is how can we compare uh, observations uh, related to specialty lab tests, uh, which uh, differ depend uh, depending on the method that you're using. And uh, I think part of the answer to this question is that uh, in many situations, you can rely on the law code to compare observations for the same patient, but there are also situations uh, in which you need to take in account other criteria than the law code. Also the method, which is uh, another property of the observation, and uh, you also find the reference ranges which can be part of the observation, whatever the standard use, be it CDA or HL7V2 or FI. So um, I think we have all the tools to, to um, uh, aggregate uh, lab results, uh, but we have to be careful of using all the meaningful properties of the observation for that. Thanks for the comment. There's a question online. Um, so the question is from Andrea Pitkus, and first she says, great presentations, and then is going on to ask, what areas of laboratory medicine and pathology in Europe are electronic and discreetly captured to be encoded with LOINC, and which areas still need work? So, I, so for routine, for routine chemistry, routine hematology, um, LOINC, I think the LOINC codes are clearly sufficient for many of the tested factor R codes for multiple, <laughs> for uh, multiple units, uh, uh, which is also. Uh, one of the one of the typical issues uh, in in Europe that there are a significant difference in the units which are being used. I wanted, yeah, I think the main the main area is indeed uh, specialty testing, but I'm typically thinking about more novel biomarkers. If you're thinking newborn screening, for example, I'm thinking acid carnitins. Uh, there, there are IVD kids, you have a number of properties you can measure, you can look at certain ratios, specific acylcarnitins. But to give you a, a typical example, uh, even when we participate for external quality control, we separate two components, for example, uh, C4DC succinyl uh, CoA and methylmalonyl CoA. Many people don't separate this. These are issues. I mean, it's almost impossible to, to solve this in an easy fashion. This has to do 
with methods, with standards, um, even for external quality control, we need to, to combine these, uh, these results then, but obviously our interpretation is somewhat different. Some of it, I think, can never be solved with generalization, so there will always need to be some flexibility to account for um, reporting, uh, let's say, in-house kind of results, which are not that easily uh, standardized. The same in toxicology, you have uh, novel, novel design drugs which, is, which you can uh, discover, uh, you can give some semi-quantitative results, the same is, is for organic asset analysis, huge differences in, in precision, no international standardization, so the result of 20 in one lab can be 40 or 50 in another lab. Obviously you have the reference values, but then again, yeah, typically you have the clinical interpretation, which is the ultimate, <laughs> the ultimate <laughs> result. So that's an area, it's not well standardized, but it's not so easy to see how with additional work you could uh, really solve this, let's say, in, uh, in, an, uh, in, uh, in a way which is completely resolving all the existing issues. So but I, think most of, I think most of the areas are, are very well covered by, by law as an organization. Many thanks for your answer, Peter. We have time for one more, if you dare to. Yes, <laughs> lady. <laughs> yeah, hi. I've got a question for uh, Judith from the uh, MedTech uh, Europe. Um, uh, about the standardization of the test results, what kind of role could MedTech play in this, for example? Is there a role for MedTech to, yeah, to try to realize this? I'm sorry, uh, can you repeat the question? It was about standardization of? Of test results. So that the, and no matter where uh, a test is performed in, 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 uh, or from which company, uh, that the test result is um, the same harmonized <coughs> and that you can easily exchange it without misinterpretation. Um, uh, we see that the IVD suppliers, well, they do a lot of work, but it, it, well, as a clinical chemist, we think it could go faster. Is there perhaps a role for medtech to, um, yeah, in this process? Yeah. So, as um, a trade association bringing together um, different um, national, European, and multinational, multinational companies across Europe, we are uniquely placed to bring together manufacturers to. Um, understand each other's requirements and to understand it and bring awareness to what each and everyone needs. So we can, as Metric Europe, provide a good platform for that exchange, for um, creation of awareness. And at the same time, we're also the ones um, uniquely in a position to connect to EU institutions um, to share what is needed on the ground to share what's happening practically on the ground. So really to be that kind of um, kind of connector that brings the partners together. So that will be our role in this. Thank you, Judith. There's one more comment from Clement. Yeah, the one area that's particularly, um, I don't want to say too strongly, is a mess, is flow cytometry markers because when you see what they call them, you can't be sure what they are. You know, they don't always give the gating or the cell type, etc. So we really need to focus some industry effort on a systematic way of naming flow cytometry markers because you can't code them. I mean, they're really tough because they don't say enough. Thanks for the comment. I think now it's really time to conclude, unfortunately. Has been a super interesting round here. I would like to thank all the speakers here in the room, online, many, many thanks. And also thank you for staying a few more minutes. And Personally, I would like to shout out a big thank you to one guy who has been working almost day and night to bring the people together to prepare everything to invite the speakers, and that is Xavier Gancel from Biomérieux.
I know I'm between lunch and, uh, you know, you're between you and lunch. And please feel free to, to go. And sorry that we took some more minutes. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care. We will start our next presentation precisely at 1 o'clock, so we have a very short time for lunch. Thank you.